Awesome. So, uh, so Katie and I, we've got three kids, and, and we actually started teaching our kids to apologize for things even before they could say a lot of words. Like they didn't, sometimes they didn't even have words yet, but we would still teach them to apologize anytime, you know, they'd start like hitting their brother or sort of thing. And we'd say, all right, you need, you need to say sorry. And the way we would have them say it is, is they like make like a kissing, you know, like a, like that's how they'd apologize to their brother. And then we'd teach the other one to say, what, what, what? Yeah, before they could even talk. Yeah, and then like eventually they'd learn to say the word sorry, right? But, but that's what we would do. We would teach them to, to apologize to their brother when they're, you know, beating on their brother for some reason. Uh, and that's true that even at their age, they will beat on their brother. So uh, I don't think it's something that's a good thing, but we teach them to apologize. And then we, we use that as an opportunity for their sibling to be like, all right, do you forgive do you forgive your brother? You know, and we, we would teach that. And, and what's interesting is it, they didn't necessarily even fully get the concept of what sorry meant, uh, that they would, you know, they would eventually say the word, but they, you know, they were the sorry, not sorry sort of situation where, you know, they're saying it, but they don't really mean it because sometimes like, right, because they're like, okay, I just have to say this word and then I'm done, right? Like, I'm good now. Like, I'm not going to get a time out or anything. And and while they're saying sorry, they're still in the active process of trying to hit their brother. Like they're like, oh, I'm sorry. And like they're still trying to like do damage to their sibling. So, so clearly they didn't quite get the idea of what sorry meant. And, and the Bible talks about that, that there are those who, who write are they come to Jesus, they experience Jesus. And, and they might even call him Lord, but Jesus is saying like, but you're not doing the things that I'm telling you to do. You know, that, that we, might, we might apologize, we might admit sin, we might say like, well, I know that, you know, God says that's wrong to do, but we almost sometimes might not have any intention of changing our behavior. That we might be full on just like planning on, well, I'm still going to go and do this, even though God says this is wrong, right? Like I might say, oh, God, forgive me but also I'm not planning on changing my mind anytime soon, right? We're the, it's the sorry, not sorry thing. We're in the active process of doing the wrong thing while being like, God, forgive me. And like, you know, we're, we're causing harm to ourselves or other people because of our sin. Now, now this, uh, usually I'm, I'm like an upbeat, jolly guy and I still am. God is love. We're, we celebrate the forgiveness that he offers. But this, this sermon might be a little bit in the heavier category. It might not be one that we're like going to leave like, yeah, there we go. You know, we're not, I'm probably not going to get a lot of amens from the crowd today, but that's okay because uh, the Bible speaks truth and, and I'm going to do my best. I pray today that I'll be able to speak truth in love, right? In a way that, that we'll be able to hear it. And, and the idea is that even though we might not always be comfortable with truth, we might not feel the most happy about truth, uh, we need to hear it, right? And, and, and when I'm preaching something like this, it's, it's not like I'm preaching against you guys, right? Or I'm not preaching against me. I'm preaching for you. I'm preaching for me because we need to hear truth. And it might feel like uncomfortable. It might feel like I don't like hearing this because we all have our sinful nature. We all have our flesh that wants to do things our own way, right? So this sermon, hopefully, just so you're aware, is super welcoming. It's super inviting to experience the forgiveness that God offers, but yet the person it won't feel comfortable for is, is my and your sinful nature, all right? So just if there's a little bit of squirming, that's why. It's because like we're wrestling that out and we're gonna all try to hold on to our like secret sin until the end of the sermon and just try to endure and like, ah, and, and just go home and do our own thing so we don't have to think about it anymore, right? But, but that's okay. This, this sermon is gonna be good. It's healthy to hear the word of God, to, to see what God's word says and that it behaves like the mirror that when we see it, we can kind of see like, oh, like I gotta, I gotta clean something up here. This isn't quite right. I, I shouldn't go in public like this. Something needs to change, right? So that the, the word of God is, is for our good. Our flesh needs to hear this. And so we've been going through the book of Acts and we're in Acts chapter 17. If you, if you want a Bible, I'll ask George to maybe grab you a Bible. Just raise your hand. We've got these blue Bibles over there. You can take one. It's our gift to you. And we're on page 667 of that Bible. I'm just going to read a verse from that page today. But you can, you can keep that Bible nonetheless and follow along elsewhere. And Paul is preaching to the city of Athens. He's been, he's been teaching them about this, this God that is unknown to them, but yet wants to be known by them. That God is, is a God who wants us to seek him and find him. And today, this is the thing that, that we're going to read that he said. He says, Acts 17, verse 30. 
This is God's will for all nations, all people. He says that the times of ignorance God overlooked, that there were times when, right, entire nations or generations of people were just about doing their thing their own way, that they would just be, you know, God was working with the children of Israel, right? God would sometimes have people outside the Jews that would come in and experience and encounter him. But it says that in general, he just kind of like let them make their choice, let them walk in their sin. But notice what God's will is now. Since Jesus, since the offering that he made for forgiveness of our sins, this is what he, he commands. He says, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That's God's will for all people. That's God's desire for all people. This is his solution, the means by which we can experience forgiveness, the means by which we can experience relationship and being reunited with God. The solution to our sin problem, right, isn't pretending that our sin isn't there. The solution to our sin problem is repentance. Now, you might not know what that word means. Repent just literally means to to turn around, to change direction, or or to change your mind or the way you've been thinking about something. Right? Repentance means that I'm going to admit that God was right about this and I'm, I'm wrong, that I'm, I'm wrong about this, that I'm not going to continue to do life my own way. I, I've, I've been reading through the book of Proverbs this month and I went back to like read it in the Old King James, which I haven't read Old King James for a while, probably since I was a teenager. Right? Old King James, it's just, or King James version is what it's called, the not new King James. And, and one of the words I had to look up, because I had to look up words because it was in Old English, one of the words was, was uh, froward, froward, not forward, but froward, right? I had to look up, like, what does this mean? What is a froward person? What is frowardness? And, and think of the, the words, you know, to and fro, to and fro, right? Frowardness, right? Frowardness is to be, uh, to walk in your own way, to walk away from God, to do things according to your own will, right? To walk a crooked path, right? To be willfully opposed to the things of God, to be perverse, so the idea of repentance, right, is I'm going to go from my frowardness, walking away from God, and I'm going to turn, I'm going to change direction, walk toward God now, right? I'm going to walk toward him. I'm going to do things his way. And even though I'm not there yet, it's a matter of instantaneous rate of change, right? It's a matter of, of direction. It's a matter of where am I going? What's my progress, right? That not any of us are perfect by any means, but are we fighting that fight? Right? Are we pressing in towards God? Are we moving towards his will for our lives? Right? Is that the desire of our heart? So, so that's the idea is that God commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn from doing life their own way and to turn towards doing life his way. And, and one of the things that I'll point out is that our culture gets offended when we call something sin. Right? Our culture gets upset like, no, 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 you can't say that right? You can't call this sinful, right? Our culture gets offended when we, when we say that repentance is necessary for forgiveness, right? That sometimes Christians can be accused of being discriminatory for agreeing with what God says. But I want to point out here that notice that God is not discriminatory. Notice that God doesn't call some people to repent. He calls all people everywhere to repent. There's zero discrimination there, right? I don't need to repent of your sin. I need to repent of my sin, And God's solution for you is for you to repent of your sin, right? All people everywhere, that is God's desire. So it's not a matter of like, you know, discrimination here. It's a matter of, no, 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 this is God's solution for everybody. This is the means by which we can take hold of the grace that God has made available to us. So so we aren't judging a particular sin as worse than the others. We're not, we don't really care about that. It's, I'm more interested in, has the word of God been making an effect in my heart? Has it impacted my life? Has it produced change in me? Is it bringing me closer and closer to being more and more like Jesus? So it's not about like what sins are worse. It's about all of us, every person, all people need to repent. That's, that's the idea. That's, that's the idea. And, and repentance requires action. It's not just a matter of saying the words that you're sorry. It's not just a matter of acknowledging or admitting like, yeah, I was wrong. Right, because that puts us in that sorry, not sorry category, right? That we're, well, you know, I'll say the words or I'll pray a prayer, you know, or maybe I'll pray one prayer a lot of times and I think God forgives me now and now I can go do my own thing. But no, 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 repentance requires action. 
Jesus pointed it out this way because he had he dealt with with right religious people who thought they were good enough before God that thought like no 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 I've got my life together I don't have any sin in me I have nothing to repent of it's it's those people who need to repent but I'm good like God's proud of me right and that that there would be these religious people that they looked like they had it all together on the outside but inwardly Jesus knew that they had sin issues that he right said they had to acknowledge they had to deal with And in Matthew 21, this is what Jesus said, because he's talking to some of these religious people, because he'd be preaching to the crowds, and then these religious people would show up, and they'd be, like, offended at Jesus. Uh, And and Jesus asked asked this. He tells a story. He says, what do you think? Let's say a, a man had two sons, and he said to the first son, son, go work in the vineyard today. Right? This is what the will of the father was. Go, go work in the vineyard. And the son says, I will not Right? So the son is defined. By his words, he's not planning on doing the will of his father. But later on, he, what, he changes his mind right, and went. So he, he was planning on doing things his own way, and then he, he changes his mind and says, I guess I should go work in the vineyard. My dad told me to. I'm going to go do this. This is the right thing to do. Right? So that was the first son. The second son right, is this. Uh, and he went to the other son and said the same thing. And this son answered, I go, sir, right? You got it, dad. I'm going to do what you asked me to do, right? I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the will of the father, but then didn't do it. They did not go into the vineyard. And now Jesus asks this this question from this little story. I mean, neither son was perfect here by any means, but notice what Jesus asks. He says, which of the two did the will of the father? And the crowd kind of, they, they get this, they say, the first son, right? Even though he said the wrong things, he eventually changed his mind. He eventually turned and did what the will of the father was. And so now Jesus doesn't leave it there. This is what he, he was telling his story to make a point, to talk about the crowd that he was with. And this is what he says. Uh, next verse, 32. Or, no, nah, I guess it's not 32 yet. But he says, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you do. Right? He's referring to the religious people. He says, listen, the, the people who are the bad sinners, who on the outside look like they're the worst, they're, they're going into the kingdom of God before you do. Right? That you look like you have your life together, but they're, they're encountering God in a genuine way, and you're missing it. You're missing it, right? And this is what he says, verse 32. For John, he's referring to John the Baptist, came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. John was the one that preached repentance to turn from our sin. And he's saying, Jesus is like, listen, all of these people that had these outward sins, they listened, they turned, they changed their mind, and they they followed, and they did what John asked and what's he say? But, and even when you saw this, even when you saw all of these people turning from their sin, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. So what I want to point out here is that Jesus is not saying that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven because God loves sin. Okay? That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that they're entering the kingdom of God because they believed what John was preaching. And John was preaching a message of repentance, of turning from their sin, right? That maybe they, they looked worse, but they were willing to admit, like, I don't have my life together. Like, I'm, I need God in my life. I'm doing this my own way, and I'm messing up bad, right? They were willing to admit that. And Jesus is critical of the religious leaders in his day because he's like, listen, you guys look good on the outside. You're so pious, right? You've got these fancy robes and you're religious and you say these long prayers in front of everyone to see out in the streets. But inwardly, Jesus would say, like, listen, you guys are full of pride. You're self-indulgent, right? That it's not just the outward things that matter. Or that Jesus said this in in Matthew 5. He says, right, "If, if you lust after someone in your heart, you've already committed adultery, or if you're angry with your brother without cause, you, you've already committed murder in your heart, right? Jesus is like, listen, it's not just about the outward appearance, but the issue was that these Pharisees were too proud to admit they needed to change. They thought they were good enough on their own. But the, the solution for all people everywhere, there's not one of us that could be like, well, I don't, I don't think I need to repent of anything ever. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm good, 
Like, I'm just a good person. God's happy with me. But no, no, no. The idea is that all of us, all people everywhere need to repent. No matter how well put together your life might, might look, right? No matter how good you look on the outside. And the good news here that Jesus says is that, that God welcomes sinners. God welcomes people like you and me, right? That we don't have to have it all together. We don't have to somehow try to be good enough to get his approval or to get to heaven. That Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners, the Bible says. While we were his enemies, Jesus was willing to show his love for us in his pursuit of us, that he wanted to have relationship with us, right? So that God welcomes sinners. And, and what's cool about this story is that you may have spent your whole life doing what was opposite of what God would desire, being opposed to God, working against his plan for your life, but you can change your mind in a moment, right? You could be like the, the tax collectors or the prostitutes. You're just doing life your own way, and it's as simple as, am I, am I willing to change my mind? Am I willing to turn? Am I willing to repent? And that doesn't mean that you're suddenly perfect afterwards. It just means that, right, you might still stumble and struggle occasionally, right? That, that's a reality of how it is because we still have our sinful nature. But it's, it's a matter of desire. It's a matter of direction. It's a matter of our goal, right? Am I, am I willing to fight the sin in my life, and, and sadly, the other thing that Jesus says here is that you might be saying all the right things, right? You might say like, oh no, I love God, or God forgive me, right? Or you might call Jesus Lord, and he says many call him Lord, but don't do the things he asks, right? But even though you're saying the right things, you might not have done the right thing in your heart, which is to repent, right? But through repentance, we can experience forgiveness, we can experience reconciliation to God, all right, and by the way, just side note, this isn't just a message for people who don't yet know Jesus. This is something that all people, right, all believers, like, I just had to repent yesterday, <laughs> right? Like, it's not like somehow we're in a different category. It's just that God's word continues to expose things in our lives that are like, oh, man, or like, oh, I'm still struggling with this, right? And I'm willing to repent. I'm willing to turn from that and admit that it's, it's a problem. Let's see, in, in Acts 14, Paul preaching at another sermon to a different city. This is how he phrased it. Because when we hear repent, we're like, no, I don't like this. This isn't good news. This, this isn't a fun thing to hear. But the reality is that repentance is a message that is good news. All right? It's probably not the way we'd think right away. But this is what he said. Uh, what happened in this situation, I'll fill you in. Paul and Barnabas, they heal some dude. And then the people of the city are like, wow, those guys must be gods because they just healed this guy. And they start worshiping Paul and Barnabas, which just so you know, we are not gods, people are not gods, we don't worship people, we worship God. So, so this is what Paul says to them, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news, right? So think about what would you categorize as good news, right? What would you think like good news would be? Like what's good news to you? Because we probably wouldn't think what they're saying next is, is all that great news. Like, our, the flesh side of us would be like, I don't like that news. <laughs> like, I, that's not good news. I don't want to hear that. But, but listen what he categorizes as good news, that you should turn from these vain things. Right? That you should turn, that you should repent from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Guys, repentance is good news. Repentance is good news, that, that we can turn from our sin, that we're not trapped in this, that I, this is not the destination of my life, that I just have to continue struggling with the same thing forever, right? That it's good news that I can turn from it, that I can experience the forgiveness that God offers me, right? And turning from sin, well, it may still seem difficult, right? Because we still like sin. It's not like we just completely are unappealed by it. Right In Hebrews, the Bible says that Moses, he decided, he chose rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to have the, the passing pleasure, the fleeting pleasure of sin. Right? Sin is pleasurable, just so you're aware. But it's, it's fleeting. Right? It doesn't last. It's, it's not a good long-term investment, just so you're aware. We don't want to give that up because it is pleasurable for us. There is something we get out of it. But it's worth turning from. It's worth giving up. 
And the reason that repentance is good news is because the alternative is slavery and death. That's not good news, right? Like, no matter how that pleasure might be, it, it, it disappears, and then I'm stuck with slavery and death. And repentance offers freedom. Jesus says that when, when we choose to obey sin, that we are a slave to whatever we obey. Right, that when, I, when I'm obeying sin, I'm a slave to it, and repentance is the means by which I can be free. Jesus made it possible for us to be free from sin. Or, or, or the Bible says this, that repentance leads to life. Acts eleven eighteen. this is Peter and his buddies talking. He preaches to Gentiles, which are the non-Jews, people probably, probably like you, right? People like me, I don't have a Jewish heritage. And this is what, what they said. When, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Right? You can go back and read that story on your own time, but, but I want to point out that repentance leads to life. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but repentance leads to life. The alternative is bad news, but repentance is really good news. So that's what Paul's saying is that we can turn from these vain things, that this is empty, that this is worthless. It's not going to pan out in our favor. That we all need to turn from our sin. And notice what he's, he says back in, in Acts 14 there. Notice he doesn't say turn from our sin and then towards like a religious system. He doesn't say turn towards like a set of rules. He doesn't say like turn towards self-righteousness and just like relying on our own good works. He says, turn to a person. Turn to the living God. Repentance is good news because I'm, I'm exchanging sin for a relationship. That I'm able to have relationship with God. That he's made forgiveness available that I can, I can be with him. That I can be with him forever. And this is the God who is the living God. The God who loves us. So we're not turning towards legalism or self-righteousness. We're turning to a person, which is the living God. And forgiveness can be experienced through believing in Jesus and the, the work that he did on the cross, through repenting of sin and then deciding to follow Jesus. That's the goal, that we are following Jesus. So, so this, is, this is one thing. Jesus was serious about repentance of sin. Jesus was so serious about this issue. This is something that he preached all the time. This is something that he commanded to be preached by his disciples, right? He wasn't like messing around with this issue. Here, here's another situation with Jesus in, in Luke 13. Uh, this is, so once again, he's hanging out, preaching to the crowds, healing people, doing his thing. And then people come up to him, Luke 13, verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. There's a bunch of words there you probably don't get. But basically, there were these people who Pilate, the ruler of that area at that time, he was a Roman, right, governor, that he had all of these people killed as they were trying to serve God to practice their, their Judaism. That, that all of these people died. That Pilate had them killed. There's this tragedy that happened. And someone in the crowd, right, they, they like come up and tell, Jesus, did you hear about what Pilate just did? He just slaughtered a bunch of people. Right? And in the midst of this tragedy, what does Jesus then turn the discussion towards? Notice what he does. Verse 2, he answered them and said, Do you think that these people, these Galileans, were worse sinners than all of the other Galileans? Do you think these people that died in this way were somehow like being punished because of their lives? Right? That they were worse than all the others that didn't die that day? Was this just a matter of like bad things happening to bad people? Right? Jesus is like, what, what do you think about, like, do you think that these people were worse than you are? Is that why you think you are alive here today? Right? Jesus is using this moment of tragedy to get people to think about their own lives. He says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus used this, used this opportunity while people were considering their own mortality and being like, listen, it doesn't matter if you think they were worse than you or not. What are you doing with your life right now? People died today and you're still here. One day you will die. But what are you going to do with the moment you have right now? 
What are you going to do with this time? Because this is the chance that you have right now. You can repent and turn from living life your own way. That, that, that's what Jesus says. And then he brings up another tragedy. He says, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell, uh, fell and killed them. Another tragedy. Some tower fell down and killed 18 people. Jesus brings this up. He says, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Was this God punishing these people? Was this like karma or something? And Jesus is like, that's the wrong question. Don't think about how bad those people were to have that happen to them. Use this as an opportunity to, to be introspective. He says, no, I tell you. It's not that they were somehow worse than other people. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So I want to point out that, that someone's suffering is not somehow a metric of whether or not God is, is blessing them or cursing them. That the Bible is full of examples of people who suffer while doing the good thing, the right thing, and it also has examples who experience uh, momentary success while doing the wrong thing, right? That, that, that it's not a means to be like, oh, well, these are the good people, you know, or these are the bad people, or look how blessed my life is, so God must just, I must just be really good. That's not necessarily how we measure it. Jesus is like, listen, don't even think about that. What about you? One day you're going to die. And today, while you are alive, you have an opportunity to repent. That's, it's a good idea to do that right now is what Jesus would say. Right? Forget whose sin is worse. Jesus says we need to repent. And I want to point out, Jesus is God in the flesh. The God who is love was someone who is passionate about preaching repentance. Repentance is good news. It's the loving thing to teach. It's not unloving to, to ask someone to repent. It's not unloving to do that because, like I said earlier, the alternative is slavery and death. That the, the loving thing to do is to warn as Jesus was doing. He's like, listen, you're alive right now. Use this opportunity to repent. And Jesus, even before he ascended into heaven in Luke 24, the last thing he commanded his people was like, listen, you need to go into all the world to preach repentance for forgiveness of sins proclaimed in my name. Like, listen, this is the means by which we experience this awesome forgiveness that God offers us. This is, this is the means by which we experience it. So Jesus doesn't just simply like ignore sin. He doesn't pretend that sin doesn't happen. He himself paid the full penalty for all sin, right? It wasn't just like a freebie of like Jesus just being like, oh, let's just forgive everybody. Let's just like delete this on the account and everyone's good. No, no, no. He paid the full penalty for my sin and your sin. And if Jesus thought that his death was worth it, that I could be free from sin, that should change the way I think about sin. If, if he thought that dying was worth it so that we could be free, that should change the way we think about our sin. We shouldn't just like, you know, be happy that God forgave us and then go back and wallow in the very thing that he wanted us free from. So, so our belief is something that should change us. Right? We're saved by believing what Jesus did for us, by trusting him, but that belief produces change. I'm not talking about being saved by good works. I'm talking about once we are saved, once we experience the grace of God in our lives, it produces change in us. Right? That if, if I believe that Jesus died to free me from sin, it should change the way that I look at sin and the way I live, even though I'll still struggle with it. It should change my goal. This is what, what John the Baptist would preach who Jesus mentioned earlier in Matthew 3, verse 8. He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. All right, that's probably like a weird way to say it. Like you're like, what? Like what, what does that mean? Your, your life should display the, the change that happened because you repented, is what he's saying. Or, or the New Living Translation says it this way, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Your life should produce things that are different as a result of what you've experienced, as a result of what you've done. So bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, right, don't make a presumption here, which by the way, presume and assume both mean to take some, some thing as, as for granted as being true. An assumption is just like a guess, whereas a presumption has some amount of evidence behind it that you have a, a little bit more certainty than just an assumption. 
He says, so don't presume and say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Right, he's talking once again to these religious leaders who are like, no, 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 we're Jewish. God loves us. We're fine. We don't need to repent. We don't need to change. And, and John the Baptist is like, listen, don't presume that, right? For I tell you, God is able to raise up right, children of Abraham from these stones. Don't just presume that, well, no, I, I don't think I, I have a, a sin issue. I really don't need to repent of anything. Like, Brian, you're, this is nice that we're all here today, but, but really, you're wasting your time. You don't need, this wasn't for me. Maybe for some other people. I mean, I'm pretty sure, hmm. <laughs> right? But no, not me, right? Don't presume that you're being spiritual, means that you're right with God. Don't presume that because God is a forgiving God, which he is, means that he's just going to be like, hey, let's just, everybody, just everybody going to heaven, doesn't matter what you, you know, whether you've repented of sin or not, right? Whether you've received what Jesus did or not, right? Don't presume that. Verse 10, he says, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is not, this, by the way, this is not a gospel of, of being good enough. All right, I've said that a few times, but I just want to make sure we all know that. This isn't about like, well, I need to be good enough, I guess, because otherwise, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that ground, make it pretty clear. But the idea is that, that we need to believe, right, that God died for our sin. We need to turn from our sin to follow him, and then he produces change in us. It's something that the Holy Spirit does, which is awesome. Right? The Holy Spirit sanctifies us is what the Bible talks about. That, that uh, Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in you will bring it through to completion. Right? That God starts the work and we are just working with him, fighting the sin in our lives. Right? That, that there needs to be fruit that is produced from our lives. There needs to be change eventually. Or this is the way Paul said it in Acts 26, 20, that he, he's summarizing his entire ministry and this is what he says. But I, Paul, declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles. What was he preaching? What was Paul traveling around doing all of this, right? What was he proclaiming? That they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. Right, that after we turn towards God, that now we should start living as though we meant what we said. Right, that there should be change. Repentance is, is a good thing, guys. Repentance is good news. It's the only means to which we can correctly deal with our wrongs. It's the only means to which God's provided for us to experience forgiveness. Repentance is good news, right? Our typical reactions to our wrongdoing is, is to have right, guilt and condemnation, right? Or to experience shame or, or to, to run further from God. Well, I don't think he wants to see me right now. Like, I'm just living, my, living life my own way. I'm just going to hide from God. I'm just, you know, just, uh, you know, hope I can avoid him. Or, or, or sometimes we'll have the strategy of denial. No, I don't have a problem. I'm just going to pretend I don't have this issue. But we do. The, the Proverbs 28, 13 says, people who conceal their sins will not po- uh, prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Right? Denial isn't going to help us. The only solution to our wrongdoings is repentance. We can't just make excuses for sin. We can't just pretend that it's not sin anymore. Well, let's, let's just redefine what God says is wrong so that I can feel better about myself. Ephesians 5, 6 says, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. God is a loving God. God did everything he could to make a relationship with him possible. But I do want to let you know that, right, even though his, his love is, is everlasting, right, he, he's slow to anger. He's slow. It takes him a long time to get there. But he does get angry about sin. So we can't just pretend that we don't have a sin problem. We can't just pretend like, no, 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 like, I, I, or everyone's like me, though. Like, or I'm not even as bad as those people. Like, I'm fine. God commands all people everywhere to repent. In, in 1 John, I'm going to read a, a handful of passages here because sometimes we'll just have this, like, we'll pretend we have no sin. We'll pretend like, no, no, I, well, I'm not perfect. I'm human, but I don't sin. Like, 
You know, we'll, we'll pretend that that's the case. And this is what John the Apostle says, and, and I challenge you this week to read the book of 1 John, right? I've got the page number on the, on the handout there for you. It's only five chapters. It's a short letter that he wrote. And this is what, one of the things he says. So 1 John uh, verse 5, this is the message that we uh, have heard from him and proclaimed to you. John the Apostle was an eyewitness of what Jesus did. He was one of his disciples. He was hanging out with him and he's like, listen, this is what Jesus told us and now we're telling you, all right? That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And now notice our typical strategies. If we say we have fellowship with him, him, well, we walk in darkness. If I'm like, no, 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 me and God hang out all the time, but I'm not trying to live a life any different. If I'm just wallowing in the darkness of my sin, This is what he says. This this is hard words, which by the way, like this hits all of our hearts, just so you're aware. He says that we lie and do not practice truth. But here's some good news. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, not just with God, but with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. Notice the first and the last part of that verse. If we walk in the light, you might be like, man, I guess that means I have to live a perfect life. No, because if that was the case, then why do I need Jesus to cleanse me of all sin? Walking in the light does not mean you're perfect. It just means you're forgiven and you're living your life in the reality of that forgiveness. That's what that means, right? That <laughs> I need the blood of Jesus to cleanse me from all sin. Or here, here's our other strategy, the denial route. Verse eight, if we say we have no sin, who do we deceive? I'm not fooling you. I'm not fooling God. It says we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But here's the solution, verse nine. Right, I just wanna hold these side by side. Verse nine, if we confess our sins, that's not to a priest. You don't have to tell me. That's just between you and God. You can talk to him. He wants to hear you, okay? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And once again, if we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar. We make him to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So, so if, if you're in the category where you don't think you need to or don't think you ever had to repent, whew, this is what he says. You're deceiving yourself. The truth isn't in you. You're calling God a liar, and his word's not in you yet. Right? Just, this is how serious it is. This isn't an issue that I want to like just have be vague and blurred because it's important that we respond correctly to what God's word says. But if we confess our sin, or actually I said that wrong, if we confess our sins, plural, all of them, right? That I'm willing to repent of, of all of my sin, not just one of them. Right, not just be like, well, I guess I'll give up drinking or something and that'll keep God happy. Right, I'll just throw him a bone like, all right, God, I've repent of lying that time, but I'm gonna kill, you know, just keep doing my life my own way. No, 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 we need to confess all of our sins. This is a, a quote from this guy, D.L. Moody. Uh, he lived a little over 100 years ago. He started a Bible college a little less than 40 miles from here out in Northfield, Mass. He's a really cool dude. I've only read a couple of his books. This guy's awesome. This is what he says. Breaking off one sin is not repentance. Forsaking one vice is like breaking off one limb of a tree when the whole tree has to come down. A profane man stops swearing very good, but if he does not break off from every sin, it is not repentance. It is not the work of God in the soul. When God works, he hews down the whole tree. He wants to have a man turn from every sin. Right, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. That just means I'm willing to like drop my sin and start walking towards God. Doesn't mean I'm not ever gonna like like pick it up again once in a while because I struggle with it, but am I willing to drop it again the next time and start walking towards God? All of it. And this guy, he man, this guy's got some of the coolest analogies. Next Next part of this this quote from me says, supposing I am in a vessel out at sea, vessel is a boat, okay, and I find the ship leaks in three or four places. I may go down and stop up one hole, yet down goes the vessel. Don't just repent of like a sin 
and think you're cool. Don't just throw God that bone and be like, there you go, God, hope you're happy. We need to be healed completely. Right here it says, or suppose I'm wounded in three or four places and I get a remedy for one wound. If the, if the other two or three wounds are neglected, my life will soon be gone. True repentance is not merely breaking off this or that particular sin. Guys, God's solution for all people everywhere is repentance. We don't just all by default experience his forgiveness. His, his forgiveness is free, but he asks us to, to change as a result of what he offers, to turn from that life and to trust him as our Lord and Savior. Right, that I'm willing to say, like the fact that we call him Lord means he's, he's allowed to be in charge of my life. Right, that we are to turn from all sin. So surrender all sin. Or, or here's the other thing is, don't just surrender all sin but one. Right? Don't just hold on to that one thing and be like, well, God better be happy that I gave up all of this. And yet, you know, you're trying to just endure and like, well, I just got to get out of here with my one sin left and I'll be fine. <laughs> right? Like, no, leave all sin. And perhaps there's one thing that the Holy Spirit has been convicting you or I, right, throughout this message, just hearing God's word. It's like, man, what am I doing with my life? What, like just hearing God's word just like points out the sin in us. Right? Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, when he, he comes into the world, which he did for us, right? this was after Jesus died, that when the Holy Spirit came, he would convict the world of, of sin and righteousness and judgment. That that's the work that the Holy Spirit does in all people's hearts. Right? Pointing out not to condemn us, but to convict us, to point to our need for a Savior. And if we turn from sin, notice that God is faithful. He's reliable. He will forgive you 100% every time. And that God is just. He doesn't just pretend the sin didn't happen because Jesus took that sin and paid the full penalty for it. And he will forgive. There's no more guilt, no, no more condemnation. And he will cleanse, that he begins the work in us of sanctification, making us more and more like him every day. That that's a promise that he has and all we have to do is confess our sin. Like, God, I was wrong. I was wrong. So as, as the worship team comes up, I've actually got a, a quote from John Piper with some audio to it that we can listen to and, and think this. And during these last two songs, use this as an opportunity to get our hearts right before God. I used to play those games when I was a kid. Get saved when I'm old. Because it's boring to be saved. So get saved when you're old. It won't happen. The hardness will creep over you and you will lose all your capacity to know him, see him, love him. And God will withdraw from you. Then you will perish thinking that on your deathbed you could repent and you'll be an Esau pleading for repentance and it will not be given. Don't play that game. If you're 30 years old, don't play it. If you're 40, don't play it. 50, don't play it. And sure don't play it. If you're six... Don't play that game. We will purify ourselves, meaning we're going to fight, right? We're going to fight. Nobody in this room is perfect. Nobody will be pure perfectly before you die. The question is, who's fighting? Who's fighting? Who says, yes, I want him to come. Yes, I'd like to be like him perfectly. It grieves me not to be more like him than I am. Now I'm going to fight this thing. Who's that? That's the children of God talking. And I don't care how many times you fall down. If you get up talking like that, you're a child of God. <laughs>